بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ما بعد. We usually use this time before Salat al-Jumaah to answer questions that have been submitted online. If you're interested in having your question answered, you could download our app. That's the Dar al-Hijra app. It's available both on the App Store and the Play Store. Uh, or you can scan the image when you walk in and you can submit your question anonymously. Uh, how does Islam address the issue of LGBT rights and individuals? Uh, I gave a khutbah on this a few weeks ago. Uh, but basically, when it comes to these issues, these are things that it's very important to keep in mind that, yes, we don't support individuals getting abused, right? We don't support that. Uh, nobody should be beat. No, nobody should be cursed. Uh, nobody should be hurt uh, because they identify as, uh, as gay. Saying that, is it something that we as Muslims support? Absolutely not, right? We don't support that lifestyle. Uh, we don't support advocating for it the same way that we don't support advocating for alcohol, the same way that we don't support advocating for lying or cheating or taking advantage of others. Are there Muslims who lie? Yes. Are there Muslims who cheat? Are there Muslims who commit zina and drink alcohol? Absolutely, right? You have Muslims who do all those things. The problem is between them and Allah, and they have to deal with that, and they have to work on that. But the moment somebody comes into a public space, or they come into a masjid, or they come in, even on the public sphere and start making announcements, or people start speaking publicly, saying that this is okay, and this is something that we advocate for, then we will respond. Because this is not part of the religion, this is not part of Islam, and this is not something that we will ever support. Uh, the other question is, okay, well, what about politically? You have some organizations that might ally with some of these organizations. So the question then comes is, okay, well, what is the benefit in those alliances? And that's something that needs to be explored. I personally, and maybe I'm wrong, I don't, I don't see any benefit in many of the alliances that have been formed historically. All it has done is confuse an entire generation of Muslims on um, you know, what the family is actually supposed to look like. It's confused them about homosexuality. It's confused them about transgenderism. Um, sodomy is haram in Islam, period. Changing your gender is haram, period, right? These, these things are, are not allowed. Are there people who suffer from such things? Absolutely. I and mean, even in the transgender community, I think the suicide rates are significantly higher than they are in people who are not. Um, many transgender children, they grow out of it. So it's like 80% plus, they go out, grow out of it. So this is something that's definitely a mental health issue for me, uh, less so of an Islamic one. So um, how do we deal with such people? They're, they're masakin, right? They're, they're suffering from an illness. They're suffering from a disease. What can we do to help facilitate? What can we do to help them? Absolutely. I do not think using their pronouns, so if someone says, call me a she or a zur or a zar or, you know, the different pronouns that they have, it's not going to help us by actually using those pronouns with them. If we want to be respectful to someone, we call them by their name. So if somebody has a name, if their name is John or if their name is Jane or whatever the case might be, I will keep using that person's name. But I will not engage in using pronouns because language is something that we use to communicate with each other. And the moment we remove language or the moment we change language, there is an inability to communicate. Right? And essentially, I'm accepting somebody else's delusion, right? somebody else's problem. Uh, it's the same way if somebody, you know, in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect our families, they say, oh, I can hear, I can hear a radio right? He's like, do you hear that radio? Or, hey, do you see that person watching me? And there's no radio. There's no person watching that person. And I tell that person, yes, I do. I see that. I haven't helped that person. And it's the same thing here. So a person who suffers from gender dysphoria, a person who suffers from this transgenderism, the moment I start acknowledging what they're going through, and then the moment I start validating, I have not helped them. I promise you. I have not helped them at all. If anything, I've only made things worse for them. And this is why you have mental health issues significantly higher in that community than you do in people who are outside of that community. So it's very important for us. Again, uh, there are a lot of people who need help, and we should be in a position where, inshallah, we can try to provide the help that they need to help them out of whatever issues it is that they're facing. But may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us and our families. Uh, what are the criteria for determining whether hadith is sahih or not? That's a good question. Uh, the the Muhaddithin have put together a rigorous method on how a hadith is to be determined to be sahih. Uh, there are five general conditions. There are five general conditions that the scholars look at in order to determine if a hadith is sound, if a hadith is acceptable or not. The first two have to do with the narrators themselves. So basically, we, what you will have, you'll have the Prophet wasallam say something, and then you will have a companion narrate from him, then you'll have a student of a companion known as a tabi'i, and you'll have a student of a student or a taba tabi'i. Sometimes you'll have other tabi'in relaying to each other, and then eventually at some point the hadith is recorded. Once the hadith is recorded, the narration is done, 
right? Because now it is in the form of a book. There's no reason to keep narrating, and there's no reason to continue narrating that particular hadith. So what happens is you look at every level of that chain, you look at every level of that narration, and you look at every single narrator, and you determine, is this narrator adil and is he dhabit? Is this narrator, is he trustworthy? Is he honest? And is he precise? Meaning somebody can be trustworthy, honest, precise. I trust what they're saying. I will listen to them. I know that what they're saying is they're being honest in what they're saying. But if somebody forgets a lot, can I trust what they say? Right? And then this is the, some of the conditions that the muhaddithin put forward. That not only does he need to be honest and trustworthy, he needs to be very precise in what he's recording and he needs to have good memory. The third condition is ittisal al-sanad. So ittisal al-sanad meaning that did every single narrator meet each other? So a person can be upright, a person can be honest, a person can be precise, but if he never met the narrator that came after him, then that, this is something that's called inqita, it's called a break in the chain, and this would be a reason for the hadith to be rejected. So, so far we have three conditions. One, if the narrator is dishonest, hadith are rejected. If the narrator has weak memory, then the hadith is investigated, right? Because memory is not the same as dishonesty. If the, if the hadith, the chain is connected, then we continue researching. These are the three foundational steps. The two additional steps is Adam al-Shidud wa Adam illa. Shad hadith, a hadith that is shad is an anomalous hadith, meaning that where did this hadith come from? How come this hadith doesn't agree with the other hadith? How come it's so different in its wording and its statements? This is one way for a hadith to be rejected. So even if a hadith has these first three conditions, right? When I look at it, it's like, okay, this person is trustworthy and they're honest. This person is trustworthy and honest. All of these people met, but the wording of this hadith is strange, right? There's something that's going on here. How come this is the only time and the only place that I find this hadith and it's so contradictory to a different hadith? This is called shudud, and this is a reason for a hadith to be rejected. And the last one, and this is probably the backbone of the science of hadith is adam illa. A illa is a hidden discrepancy. Illa is something that is something that you will look for if I, as a superficial researcher, came and I was like, okay, well, all of these narrators, they look good, and this chain looks connected, I will say superficially, oh, this hadith is sahih. And the scholars of Ilal, the scholars of Ilal, what they'll do is be like, no, actually, these two people, they never met. Or they'll be like, yes, all of these people are that, and these people did meet, but he, he made a mistake in his narration. There is waham. He... Rakib al hadith, like it's not ba'du abad, meaning that he's so used to narrating certain types of narrators that he connected this chain with this matan, right, with this wording of the Prophet. It is a very precise science. So, but this is in the entire backbone of the hadith sciences is built upon this, and that will determine whether a hadith is broken, whether the Prophet actually said it, whether the narrator made a mistake. And again, where is this where is the science of illa actually work and these hidden defects work? It works when the hadith looks sound, right? When the hadith looks sound. So you have a, a number of scholars that have worked in this field. Um, most famously, Imam Dar Qutni. He has a, the longest works in illa. Uh, it's called illa. Uh, Imam Dar Qutni, uh, or al and if you hadith al uh, this is something that uh, he wrote. He was a, a fourth century scholar, rahimahullah ta'ala, and other scholars of al very famously, Imam Bukhari, Imam Ahmed, and other than them. Wallahu alamu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam.